Okay, so we looked at for the longest time, the first quarter, um, the first enemy of um, productive faith, which was complacency. And so now we're moving into isolation. And so the title today is The Case for Fellowship. What does that mean? That means we're building a case for the importance and the significance of fellowship. Let me start by giving you um, that definition of fellowship, and this should be on the screen for you guys. Fellowship, you might have to take a picture or just don't feel like you have to write all of it. Obviously, we're gonna be here for a while going over these things. Fellowship is a close association of friends or equals sharing similar interests. It's friendship, it's camaraderie, it's the companionship of individuals in a congenial atmosphere and on equal terms. Terms. It's a society of people sharing mutual interests, experiences, and activities. And so keep that definition um, in front of you as we move into a case for fellowship. Obviously, we know, and just write down the reference, that God expects productivity of us. He expects you to produce. Regardless of how the world would class you, He wants you to produce. He gave talents and gifts unto men, Matthew 25, um, 14 through 30. Read over the parable of the talents at least once a week. Be aware that you are gonna give an account for what you were given. Not what you did, but what you were given. And we don't all have the same amount of gifts. We don't all have the same responsibilities, but we are all gonna stand before him at the end of our life and have to give an account. And so Genesis 1, 26 through 28, being made in his image, he blessed us, why? Just so we could sit around on our duff? No, so that we could be fruitful, so that we could multiply, so that we would fill the earth and subdue it using all of its vast resources in the service of God and man, having dominion over the fish of the sea. In John 15, seven through eight, um, Jesus said, if you live in me, abide vitally united to me and my words remain in you and continue to live in your hearts, ask whatever you will and it will be done. When you bear much fruit, everyone say much fruit. And ultimately, the size of your plans reveal the size of your faith. Which means if we're moving from faith to faith and from glory to glory, your plans should be getting bigger and bigger and bigger. Right, you should, you should be increasing. Not, in the, in the, in that exactly what the enemy is such a pervert? The older you get, he wants you to start downsizing. Right. He wants you to start slowing down instead of speeding. It's the exact opposite of actually what God's designed, that you would be more productive in your latter years than you were in your former years because you're trying to figure stuff out. You know, you, you need apprenticeship, internship, growth, accountability, right? Um, Proverbs 18, one, one who separates or isolates himself seeks his own desire. He quarrels against all sound wisdom. I want you to write this statement down. You can't produce in isolation. And I will really want you to meditate on these things and and inquire of the Lord for mind renewal concerning these things. I want you to acknowledge that Jesus didn't do what he did in in isolation. That God was in Jesus. Pastor Dean talked about this on Wednesday night. God was in Jesus reconciling himself to the world, which means even in Jesus's death, and, and this is hard for us to wrap our head around, but God was in him enabling him to do that, which brings us back to this understanding that it's not what we do for God, but it's what we do with God and those things that he's asked us to do. And so, but think about even Jesus in Colossians 1.18, if he's the head of the church, you, you can't do anything without your body, right? So do you realize that even Jesus is limited in the earth right now by the body? He's limited in the earth by the body. He can't even accomplish the Holy Spirit. He works with the other two, right? The Holy Spirit reveals Jesus to us. Jesus revealed the Father to us. They don't work in isolation. They don't work in isolation. The only model for that that we see that we don't want to emulate is Satan, yeah. Yeah. who wanted to be the only one. Yeah. Do you understand that God himself isn't even the only one? Yeah. It's powerful. Yeah. He's three in one. Yeah. Even as God, he doesn't do, he's not a one man show. Yeah. So anytime you're even like starting to like, you know, sense that stuff, yeah. 
And it can show up in our lives for many different reasons. But as long as the Lord Jesus tarries, there's a good chance we'll talk about isolation for a long time. So we'll get into that. But realize that Jesus is the head of the church and he's limited by the, the, the maneuvering and the mannerisms. The Holy Spirit does not do anything without your permission. He doesn't work in isolation. He doesn't work independent of your faith and your will. You guys have heard us tell that story innumerable times when my friend was struggling in a relationship in college and um, you know, Pastor Greg and I had already told her like he ain't the one, like that guy ain't right. And um, you know, but she was just a little bit tormented by it. And so when, when we finally inquired of the Holy Spirit, because the reality is we hadn't done that. And the enemy is the accuser of the brethren, not the Holy Spirit. Not the Holy Spirit. So anytime even people, people say like, you know, the Holy Spirit told me this, uh, he's not the accuser, right? So it wasn't until we finally like drew a line in the sand and said, listen, I said, listen, I'm done with this, okay? I'm done with you being upset. I'm, I've been done with that guy. So let's just pray. Let's pray in the Holy Ghost. And within a week's time, all those things that were hidden concerning that relationship were revealed. And he had this whole other thing going on. And so the two girls get together, right? And so my friend sits in her living room, calls him over. Hey, you know, you're doing this, totally denies it. And then she comes out the other, y'all that's like, that's television. Yeah. <laughs> like it should be on television. It was like good stuff. I actually have a job, so I'm not able to be there for the big unveiling, you know, like I'm at work, um, which is where I was when she was curled up in a ball on my, my front porch. But, but it wasn't until she got the Holy Spirit involved and said, please uncover this, that all these circumstances, and, 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 and the way that it came out, guys, it, it could have come out earlier, so to speak. So one of, so we had a, you know, Greg had a big group of guy friends, we had a big group of girlfriends, and so on special occasions we would come together, you know, and do different things, but, but for the most part, one of Greg, so a guy from our, our guy friend group ended up overhearing a conversation that this other girl had had. They had been working together, it could have happened months prior, is what I'm trying to say. Right, the, the, the paths had crossed. Yeah. They were actually all showing up at the same church on Sunday. So my friend and him sitting together and then she would come in and sit somewhere else. Now, Rama's auditorium seats 5,000 people. So you could be in the balcony and not necessarily run into each other, but you know what I mean? You could have still run into each other. Yeah. Never, because neither one of them knew that the other person existed. So it wasn't like the other girlfriend was in on it. She had no idea, right? But it wasn't until we put the Holy Ghost. So he, the Holy Spirit doesn't work independent of your faith, right? We just wanna throw up these random prayers that, that aren't full of faith and they're not based in the word and expect there to be this flow and it's not gonna happen. So you cannot produce in isolation. You cannot produce in isolation. Whatever God has called you to do, he's called you to do it with other people and who you're doing it with makes all the difference, right? Who you're called to. Genesis 2, 18, the Lord said, it's not good, sufficient or satisfactory that men should be alone. I will make him a helper suitable, adapted and complimentary for him. Now that word alone actually means the only one of his kind doesn't mean you can't produce without being married. Right. If that's a desire of your heart, if you exercise your faith for that, you can have what you can believe for. But Paul wasn't married. Right. So this isn't a case, well, I'm just never gonna be able to do what I'm called to do without that person. That's not true. Yeah. That's not true. We're not talking about being married. We're talking about being the only one of your kind, which you are now not, right? In 1 John 1, 3, we have seen and ourselves heard, and we are also telling you so that you too may realize and enjoy fellowship. Everyone say fellowship. Fellowship, fellowship as partners and partakers with us. Now this is the Amplified Classic. So we have seen for ourselves and we're telling you so that you too may realize and enjoy. Okay, so, so there's a place for revelation for fellowship and there's a place for joy in fellowship as partners, but then also partakers. So we're enjoying things together. That's good. And this fellowship that we have, which is a distinguishing mark of Christians. Fellowship is a distinguishing mark of Christians. 
Fellowship is a distinguishing mark of Christians, which is why the enemy tries so relentlessly and tirelessly to either devalue the purpose of fellowship and that association, or to get you offended and in a place where you're, you're, you're like a little orphan by choice and you run around as a foster child from house to house to house to house, from church to church to church. This is the fellowship that we have, which is a distinguishing mark of Christians, is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. Jumping down to verse seven of 1 John 1, for if we really are living and walking in the light, as he himself is in the light, we have true and unbroken fellowship. So fellowship is one of the earmarks of relationship with God. In sincere relationship with God, one of your next steps is fellowship, unhindered and unbroken with others. So there's no such thing as a person who's really close to God that's not involved and committed and in relationship with the local church. That does not exist. That is biblically unsound, okay? so. If we are truly living and walking in the light, as he himself is in the light, we have true and unbroken, which means it's sincere and unbroken. Unbroken denotes two potential things, okay? Unbroken obviously denotes the anointing. Now, I don't know where everybody's been that's in this place. I've been everywhere, man. I've been, is that uh, Johnny Cash? I I don't know where y'all been. But what I do know is that there are things that have been birthed out of man's tradition and ideas and not the anointing. I know that if you're sincere in your relationship with God and you're hungry, he's, and you're sensitive to him, he's going to see to it that you get out of there and you get in an anointed body that he has ordained. Okay, Um, so so we're not really looking back, but we're just understanding that there has to be an anointing on it. There has to be an anointing on it. It can't be man's idea. God's blueprint is that he calls a man and then he joins a body around that man. That started in the Old Testament. He did that way with Abraham. He did that way with Moses. He did that way with um, Joseph. I mean, he takes a man and then surrounds an entire organization around that man. So, so and, and a lot of people have a problem with that, depending on if you were raised in denomination and traditions with like boards and all these things. And, and if that's your problem, then just stay in that and be bored. Yeah. Amen? Because there's no fire, there's no anointing, there's no blessing on man's plans. And a lot of people like that. You know why? Because they can control it. And you can't control the Holy Ghost. Right? You can't put a budget to what he calls you to do. You can't plan that. You can't fundraise that. That's not his order. And people have problems with that. And some people never get out of that, even though they know there's more, just because of pride. They don't want to get out of that right? So unbroken involving the anointing, but then also as an act of your will, you know, you choose to be in unity with people. You choose. So unbroken isn't just about the anointing because we know, and if you don't know this, then there's probably another, another place for, for you to be. And if you're watching online, wherever your church is, you need to know that there's an anointing on that assignment. If you don't know that, then you don't need to probably be here, but, but, but unbroken involves the anointing destroys the yoke. So knowing that, but then you were taking your personal responsibility to choose unity. And then true is obviously you have to be sincere, right? You can't be fake. You can't be fake in your fellowship. And if you're fake in your fellowship, that hurts you first, but it does hurt others. So we have true and unbroken fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus Christ, his sons cleanses and removes us from all sin and guilt and keeps us cleansed from sin and all of its forms and manifestations. And so what's important, and I have a little graphic for you, vertical always becomes horizontal. Vertical always becomes horizontal. So when you have the right vertical relationship, you'll have the right horizontal relationship. And, obvi- and honestly, this, your vertical relationship should be strengthened in this fellowship. Yeah. Because when you choose this kind of unity, that denies your flesh. When you're not prideful, right. 
When you're not making it all about you and your needs and what you want and what the Spirit of God told you or whatever, right? It strengthens your relationship because all that is strife. So, so your vertical always becomes horizontal. And then I wrote it this way in my notes also, vertical affects horizontal. So you've got to know when, when your relationship with others is broken, you can't separate that from your relationship with him. You can't separate that from your relationship with him. If your relationship with people out here is broken, and, and what I mean is as it pertains to you, you can't control how people feel about you. Yeah. You can't control what people say about you or if people like you, but you can control, like you can decide, I don't know who's in strife with me, but I'm not in strife with anybody. I don't know who has made me their enemy, but I have no enemies. I have no enemies, right? So your vertical always becomes horizontal, right? I remember working um, at a, in an incredible company in Broken Arrow while I was in Bible school and we, we did, um, we were a call center, a production center, distribution center, um, did some accounting for major ministries. And um, at one point we started taking prayer calls. And we're like, you know, a lot of people from Rama worked at this company because they were really good with your hours and could work around um, your school schedule or whatever. Um, and so, we start taking these prayer calls from this one ministry and I'm like, oh no, mm -mm, no, we're not doing this, we're not doing this. Because I'm watching these kids come in second shift, these high schoolers, and they're like smoking weed on their break and coming in and now reading these scripted prayer calls, like in the cubicle next to me. Do you know what I mean? And I like, they're kids, they're not saved. I didn't even like teenagers back then. Like there was a time where I was like, trash, like you're trash. Teenagers are like, not for me, right? And so I wasn't trying to minister to them, you know what I mean, like at all. I'm just like, this is, so I get up from my cubicle one day, I still remember, and I walked into our manager's office and I was like, listen, like I'm, I'm not good with this. You know, what, you know, the, these people are calling in these ministries and they want answers and they want prayer. And this idiot sitting next to me He's high and he's like barely like scrubbing through the prayer. I, I'm not doing this. And this manager, like, and when I look back, I'm like, they were so gracious and must have really had grace for my employment there because she was like charity. And she was, I can't even get into it. We don't have time for that. But she was like charity. Cause I told her, I said, listen, I'm not taking these calls anymore. Reroute them. I'm not doing it. I'm not going to be a part of this. I'm not going to be a part of this. Reroute those not to my, <laughs> you remember this? Reroute them not to my cubicle. And she was like, Charity, but you of all people, you would be the one that we would want to take the prayer call. She like turned it around and I like walked out of there like, and, and so I was so bothered by it. And so, cause I didn't get the answer that I wanted. And so I called, I talked to Pastor Teresa cause she worked at the company at the time. And I was like, listen, like, what are we gonna do about this? Like, <laughs> this is not, this is not gonna work. And um, Pastor Teresa said, Charity, listen, God is so merciful and he's so gracious. If those people are, are staying in a place of hunger, they're staying in a place of hunger, God's gonna see to it that they're gonna be positioned in places, not that that ministry was insincere. And, and honestly, they didn't continue doing that for very long. It was just a transitionary period for them to get their own call center developed in their local church, which is what most of the other ministries were doing. We would handle their finances. We would handle their call right now and get your book or whatever. We would candle, handle kind of the secular things, but not the spiritual things. And they would have somebody in house that was doing all of their prayer calls. And so it was only a temporary thing anyway, but, but what Pastor Teresa said is when somebody's sincere and they're hungry, they're going to keep positioning, them, positioning themselves for, for more, so to speak, and for, for that right place. And so um, vertical always becomes horizontal. Vertical affects horizontal. So how you are with him is going to affect all these other relationships, but yet this all goes together. You can't, well, it's just me and the Lord and, and, and we're at home and, you know, and even like, you know, the online church and stuff, you can be taught online, you can be trained online, but you cannot be pastored online. You can't because it, it's void of accountability. It's void of the fellowship. And obviously at one point, maybe in many places still to this day, that's your only option and that's great. But, but to think that that can go on in, in an opportunity now where it doesn't have to, 
you know, and there's nothing in my town, well, you gotta move. You gotta move and be led of the Lord of where you're supposed to be because at the end of your life, you're gonna be held accountable for that. You don't take, you know, if you, especially around here, it's like, which I think it would be like, I just still think it would be so cool one day to do it because I think like in our family, we like sometimes wanna be Mexican and so, but you know, when you put like Hernandez and like Gonzalez on the back of your car and put like Shropshire and like Cal Strip underneath it, you know, and you're like repping your name, but, but in, in, in heaven, you, you take the body's name that you were to be joined with. Like you take that with you. And you're, because your plan and, and God's plan and purpose for your life is not you by yourself. It won't be void of the association and the fellowship that you were called to. Um, and let me, let me give you this thought. If someone is holding your vertical together because you're new, just make sure they know all they need to know. So as a new believer, Obviously, you're, you're still learning how to hold on to the Father. You're still learning how to walk by faith. You're still learning how to pray in the Holy Ghost, how to be led by the Spirit. Uh, you're still learning these, these disciplines of the Spirit. And so that's why, you know, internship, Bible training, accountability, all of those things are so important. But no, if someone is holding your vertical together because you're new, just make sure they know all they need to know. Because ultimately, you will let go of them if you are hiding from them. And they can't help you with things that you do not communicate. And it's not their job to get it out of you. It's not their job to ask you, well, how are you doing with this? And how are you doing with this? And how are you doing with that? It's your job to communicate those things. Because I've seen so many casualties in relationships with new believers or those that were maturing that concealed the very thing that the enemy was gonna use to take them out. But because they were embarrassed by their own flesh, because they were prideful as it pertains to the, you know, like they're the only ones. Like you're embarrassed by your addiction. Like you're the only one that's ever been addicted to that. You're embarrassed by your past. Like you're the only one that has a past. No, if you're not completely honest and you're not vulnerable and open, then whoever is holding on to you, you'll eventually let go and you'll make them the problem. And so I, I can throw this picture up. You guys are familiar with it. We've used this clip a lot, but in, in, in their um, holding on to, so obviously his leader holding on to him, this is actually in reverse. Um, the strength of that relationship is held by honesty. Yes. Honesty and humility. Yes. The strength of that relationship is held up with honesty and humility. And for people to say, well, I just, I don't feel comfortable. I just can't talk about it. That's pride. Yeah. I just can't talk to my leaders about this. Right, because you have a special thing that no one else has ever had. Yeah. It's not true. Right. So why do people isolate? Obviously, all of these things are rooted in fear and we'll begin to unpack them, but I just want you to make note of them for today. Why do people isolate? Obviously, it's all rooted in fear. Yeah. Number one, you fear intimacy. And for several reasons, this can be um, birthed in our heart, uh, your family, um, how you were raised, a lot of those um, factors can, can contribute to this. But ultimately, you just have to decide, like, do I wanna be like this forever? or do I want to be whole? Because you're in control of that. It doesn't mean that these things don't have to be dealt with. It's like what we always say, there'll always, always be triggers, there'll always be factors, but patterns prevail. So you actually start choosing correctly in line with what God's word says, and he'll help you overcome those things. But you can't sit back because you've been rejected this way and you've been rejected this way and you've been, and, and honestly, sometimes guys, people, pers the perception of what is, what is rejection? You know what I mean? Like what is rejection? You have to really even begin to define that because sometimes it's like, is that like, is that really rejection? Cause I think if someone stones you to death, that's rejection. I think if someone crucifies you, that's rejection. I think if someone walks out on you, um, I mean like my process is, is listen, like if you don't wanna be here, I don't want you to be here. So I'm not gonna take that personally. That's your problem, that's not my problem. Do you know what I mean? And so even just like the way that you even like rewrite your own past, you may not have been able to process those things like in your younger years, but now that you're older, like look back and be logical about it. 
Be logical about it and not emotional about it. And then just be like, like, Pastor Dean says this on our 12 life-changing confessions and prayerfully you do those every day. Like, even though people have rejected me in the past, my favorite is, and they may do so in the future, I will not take it personally because the Lord Jesus has already personally taken rejection for me. He's already personally taken it. That's the ultimate betrayal. That's the ultimate rejection of which I will never experience. So I'm not gonna define rejection as this big thing when it's, I'm not gonna let it be a thing. And so, but that's really the fear of intimacy, rejection, and some of those things. Um, I wrote it this way in my notes. I can be who he has made me to be with whoever he puts me with. Just like, because I'm a part of a body, just like a heart transplant or a liver transplant, my heart will fit anywhere. So if these people are out of the way, you know, like let's say if if I'm the heart and I've got a couple of arteries and this artery is like, I'm done with you. Well, my heart can work with any other artery. Do you mean? Like he likened the body to our actual body. Like if I'm the liver and, and the people around me and the body, I can work, I can work anywhere. I can work, we wouldn't be here for 33 years if we couldn't work with whoever he brings us here to work with. Psalms 127.1 says, lest the Lord builds the house, those that labor, labor in vain. And guys, when people's relationships with you go south, that's the reflection of what's not been right north. That's not on you. That's not on you. You can't filter everything everybody does through you. Like it was about you, like they were thinking about you, like you were on their mind. You weren't on their mind, their own choices were on their mind. So I can be a finger anywhere. I can, I can be, you can put me on as a finger, as a fingernail, right? You see all this surgery, skin grafts. I'm just a part of the body. So I can fit wherever he wants me to fit, whoever he wants me to fit with. I do not fear intimacy. The close people in my life may change, but as long as I hear him, I'm not changing. I'm not changing. So if the people around me change, I have no control over that. Number two, you fear not being good enough. That's why so many people isolate. And we'll get into more of these in the next um, couple weeks, but we'll stop there today. If you don't fear, if you fear not being good enough, you lack relationship with him. Because ultimately, whatever you're called to do, that's the thing that you could actually do. Sometimes it's not that you don't fear, it's not that you fear not being good enough. You don't see every part as valuable like it is. And maybe you've got your eyes on somebody else's part. And it's like, well, unless I'm doing this, I'm not valuable. No, are you there? Are you tithing? Are you giving offerings? Are you exhorting others? Are you a doer of the word? And are you serving? Because it doesn't matter where, there's no, there, there's no such thing. And we pray this in the DSM studio every single morning. God, we know there's no, there's no behind the scenes positions with you. There's no behind the scenes. So, so there may be different anointings, but if, if, if the people that are running cameras and production aren't flowing in the anointing, that's gonna hinder what's happening not behind the scenes. From God's perspective, there's no behind the scenes. Well, I'm just called behind the scenes. Everything is naked and open before him. There's no behind the scenes. That's so carnal. That's so base thinking. And then you think I don't really have a place if I'm not on the stage. And that's pride. That's wired in the same thought patterns with which Lucifer exalted himself. There's no behind the scenes. Wherever you are is like center stage from God's perspective. So what does it mean you're not good enough? Can you help? Do it with all your might. Can you, like, what are you actually, what, what do you mean you're not good enough? Good enough for who? Yeah, come on. Who called you? Yeah. Right. Who equipped you? Right. No one's handing out any Oscars. Right. Yeah. No one's handing out any awards. Sure. His kingdom doesn't operate like that. Right. So who are you not good enough for? Right. Maybe you're not good enough for your own ambitions. Yeah, come Maybe on. you're not good enough to meet the expectations of people who think your poo doesn't stink. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? I'm so grateful that I was never around people that tried to like pump me up and put me in places or, or, or plant ideas in my head of pursuits. I mean, I think at some point 
long time ago when American Idol was a thing, like there was a church par partner was like, you need to go to American Idol. And I was like, you need to get a life, bro. No one's going to American Idol. Are you serious? Like I'm in the, ki I'm in the kingdom of God. That's where I'm going to be. Now, if, you're, if the Lord tells you to go to American Idol, that's fine. I had friends that went to American Idol. That's great. That's great. One of them didn't go all the way singing. They um, were scouted by a modeling agency and ended up all over the world. I guess that was fun. I don't, you know, I thought it was fun to go into a store and be like, oh, that's my friend on the bag. Yeah. It's kind of wild, you know what I mean? But, but you've got you to gotta look at this through, am I where he told me to be? Because yeah. Yeah. if not, then you'll get bored and you'll quit. If you don't experience the success right away, if you don't feel like everybody's validating you, you don't have enough followers, you don't have enough views, you don't have enough subscribers, you just, you just think, well, I'm just behind the scenes, I'm just behind the scenes. What does that even mean? Everyone's called to do something different and all of it needs to be done in order for all of it to be done, right? So meditate on these things, really start to build your own case for this anti anti-isolation movement in your household, in your family, in all that you are called to steward, and then even in our body. And in recognizing that, again, put that, that air, like if people walk away, that's not about us. That's about their relationship with God. And if God's led them somewhere else, or if they've led themselves somewhere else, because who, who cares if it was God or if it was their flesh? I don't have time for that. I've got to, I can't pay attention to my GPS while listening to someone else's GPS. And even if it's not God's positioning system for them, even if it is carnality, I can't keep my eyes on them. I gotta keep my eyes on him. But you like process things right. You process things right. You process things in a place of wholeness and health instead of fear and insecurity and strife. So Lord, we love you.